Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life. Conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical and joyful. Today's show is City versus Country, a conversation about life in the city or life in the country and how that affects our faith and our life in general. I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and today I'm joined by co-host, Ryan Galliott, artist, Hello. resident geek, and co-host today. That's me. <laughs> and by our, a one-time co-host, Cormac McCann. Yeah, they didn't want me back. <laughs> well, we've I clearly... got relegated to guest level. Ah, <laughs> uh, no. He's, uh, he is clearly working here in the diocese in vocations and has uh, studied at Notre Dame in philosophy. And also, his qualifications for today's episode is that he has, in fact, recently moved out of the city and into uh, what he calls the country. We'll have that debate later. We have a special guest today, Beth Wells, who's worked for the church in corporate roles as a f- and is now a freelance artist and graphic designer and soon to be mum. Welcome, Beth. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Before we get started, just a reminder that if you like the show, you can help us spread the news by writing us a review on iTunes. Make sure you write it under your sign-in and also um, share it with your friends and get the word out. The more reviews we get, the easier it is for people to discover the podcast. But tell your friends. Okay, city versus country. Let's dive into the topic. What do we mean by city and country? Um, Let's start with uh, Cormac's um, attempt to move to the country. Whereabouts actually are you? (laughs) Uh, So we live in the lower Blue Mountains. Okay. uh, So technically not in a CBD. It is called the city of the Blue Mountains. Right. uh, But I would say given the, the, I can't give you the exact demographics, but lower uh, density in terms of population, cleaner air, friendlier right. people, okay. you know, generally constitutes, I'd say, some of the characteristics of a typical country lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you said friendlier people. Uh, I'd be intrigued, maybe we can unpack this during the episode, to ask the question, is it that friendlier people move to the country or that the country makes people friendlier hmm. in that sense? Like if they take the same person and put them in the country, do they become friendlier um, for various reasons. Yeah, we can mm-hmm. share some anecdotes about that later. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> and um, my own experience is that I grew up in the country. Uh, apparently, um, I, I did live for a year when, when I was very young, one year old, in Melbourne, but I actually grew up in the country. I was born in the country um, and went to school in a school of 24 kids um, in my primary school years. Record-breaking. And, <laughs> and went, to, went to a high school, which was in a country town, and um, only moved to the city when I couldn't find work as a, a 19-year-old, but have lived in capital cities in Australia uh, pretty much the rest of my life. So uh, my kids have grown up in in the city, uh, especially here in Sydney for the last 20 years or so. And Beth, <laughs> let's get, hey, here's something of your story. Um, so basically I was born in the city and then moved to the country when I was about three. Um, and I lived on a hobby farm with my mother until I was about 14 and then spent most of my teenage years back in Sydney with my dad, um, just doing school essentially. And then I didn't do so well on my ATAR and <laughs> I ended up back in the country because they're much more merciful up there <laughs> and did my business degree. Right. Um, and then I had this a similar experience to you actually. So I, I couldn't find a job. I couldn't find a part-time job even while I was doing uni. Um, got rejected by KFC. Oh, like, wow. Ouch. <laughs> 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 and I ended up um, coming back to um, the city um, to find a job and ended up working um, in uh, the Sydney Uni chaplaincy and stuff. So I've had a bit of both, which has been quite interesting. Um, uh, you know, uh, it was interesting learning how to use public transport right. <laughs> as a teenager. Yeah. You know, it's not something you have in the country, really. Because yeah. public transport in the country is probably, you know, putting your thumb out at the side of the road and saying, can I have yeah. a lift? <laughs> you going right. my direction. <laughs> and if you don't get your licence by the age of 17 in New South Wales, you're dead. Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. <laughs> oh. Thankfully, I did. I did. <laughs> we'll get to you. We'll get to you, yeah, Box. That's right. <laughs> so, Box, you've lived in various places, and, and the contribution you bring to this conversation is that you've had experience not only of different places in Australia, because you've spent time in Perth, yep. as well as in, um, in Sydney. Sydney. Yep. Any other places in Australia? Uh, when I was very young, Africa. Uh, in Sydney, uh, not in, uh, not in this Australia, but yeah. Africa, yeah. yeah, Africa, and uh, the Philippines for several months right. of every year. Now, was it in the city or the country in both those places? Uh, a little bit of time in the city, but mainly in the country. In both Philippines and Africa. Um, in well, in Africa was the country. We lived in a little compound, actually. Right. Australians, there was maybe only eight families there. Wow. Mm. So that was an interesting experience. But you got to oh. see something of the life there. Yes. Yes. I mean, the closest city was about two hours drive away. <sighs> So I remember we just spent a lot of time uh, reading and playing in the farm. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, people get, they wax, and this is perhaps a good place to start the, the conversation, people wax lyrical about country life and everything, almost always when they haven't grown up there, in the sense that there was, I spent a lot of time in the country um, looking at the country because there was nothing else to do. Um, as in I, you know, mind you, we didn't have the internet back then, so you spent a lot of time with my music in my ears or, or you know, we're inventing games or playing. I mean, we had the space to run and mm-hmm. play and do all yep. sorts of awesome things. On our property, we had a – we. My dad had got a lawnmower out, and we'd literally mowed ourselves a nine-hole golf course. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we had this really steep hill near our house, and we invented games which involved kicking the ball up the hill and chasing after it, like mm. down, sort of like down ball, but it, with a hill. And it was just an amazing place to be. But you had to have people to to hang out yeah. with. You yeah, know? And right. I was fortunate to have siblings, but people who were you know single. Um, single kid families or a couple of kids really felt isolated out mm. there because mm. there just wasn't anyone to be hang around with. Um, is that your experience of the country, Beth? Yeah, certainly. Um, so my, I, I grew up with a single mother as well, so it wasn't always easy for her to transport us into town to see right. friends a yep. lot of the time. But she was pretty good. She'd bring friends to us <laughs> sometimes. Mm. But um, I had I have one brother that I grew up with out there as well. And so we we do a little bit of the like – playing playing and stuff but we did spend a bit of time indoors um on computer games but it was funny because we kind of translated that to an outdoors sort of game thing so it was very much like a bit of both mm. which is quite interesting um and i it was funny a friend of mine recently um she was telling me so she raised uh five children in the, in the country and it was amazing because one of her boys used to go roving around their paddocks right and one day there was sort of something to do with i think they were trying to find a, like do a bit of weed control no sorry it was um they're trying to find a particular kind of frog so they had a uh someone from the university like an academic come out and he's like i can't find this frog but i know it's in this area <laughs> and guess who guess who like you know yeah. knows where the frogs are her 10 year old son who just been roving around yeah. <laughs> and he'd just been i found it amazing he'd been observing nature right yeah. you know he'd obviously been up very close to those frogs and, and had been able to identify them right um and knew that they were only in this one location like i, I thought that was incredible there's this kind of scientific mind in this child in yes. a way just that mm, yep. observation so yeah yeah. Well, we kind of distract ourselves a little bit more. I w- I'm still at – the jury's out, I think, as to whether or not that's about being in the city or whether it's about our modern culture of, you know, mm-hmm. iPhones and, and mm-hmm. computer games and things like that because I guess I grew up in a time when we didn't have a lot of computer games. I I got the first computers when they first came out and you know, built my own very early on. So I was involved in that, but I certainly didn't have it in my early childhood. Um, but um, you grew up in the city, didn't you, Cormac? Yeah, that's right. So – and this is the what I – really like pointing out in terms of my experience in transitioning uh, from city life to, to uh, more rural environments. Dangerous words. Um, <laughs> I, can st- I can start the sentence again. And no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that out. Um, but my experience of uh, city versus country life, yeah, has, has really undergone quite a radical change. Um, over the last several years, I grew up in the, the eastern suburbs of Sydney, uh, next to very illustrious venues such as the Randwick Racecourse, uh, the now <laughs> demolished Allianz Stadium, which used to be Aussie Stadium, which I actually thought was really cool till I learnt that Aussie was a, uh, a home loan company or right. a loans company. I was like, oh, it's not called Aussie like Australia. It's called Aussie the Comfort. Oh, okay, that's yeah. less cool. Oh, I'm glad they destroyed it. No. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> See, we should probably should have mentioned them in our podcast on mortgages because that was an interesting thing that that particular company did. Yeah, that's true. Leave that aside. Leaving that aside, but going on. <laughs> uh, so, and an interesting thing, so when uh, I got married, a little over four years ago, uh, and we settled early on in a unit in, in Kensington, and it was amazing because we found that though we lived in a, in a small unit block, there were only nine units, and there were you know beautiful houses on the street. Uh, in the, oh, I guess, two and a bit years that we were there, really barely, we experienced barely any interaction with any of our neighbours. Right. Polite conversations in the hallway, more awkward than anything else because, yep. oh, we're bumped into each other. Oh, hello, how are you? Yeah. Um, you still live here? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, good. <laughs> That's think, great. I, we had that when we were first married too. We lived in a block of 12 flats. And to some extent from memory, it was a little bit of embarrassment precisely because you were so close-knit in that mm-hmm. situation. Exactly. You didn't want to become too close friends because the 
you almost put harder barriers up to preserve yeah. the distinction yeah. between you and the others. Strangely enough, it felt something like that. Right. That's right. And, and, and you know, we, we'd chat to, you know, a few of the neighbours, but really the, the relationships never got any more than skin deep. Right. We moved uh, to uh, the, the, the lower to mid mountains to, to a place called Springwood, which is a beautiful village mm. uh, in roughly the lower to mid area of the Blue Mountains. And the first day we are unloading the truck, we are just getting everything out. And half the street comes up <laughs> and they introduce themselves. Hi, my name's John. Hi, my name's Steve. Yep. Hi, what do you need? Can we help? You know, yep. oh, you know, you get a knock on the door in the first two days that you're living there. Hey, how are you settling in? Yep. Oh, I noticed you're, you're expecting a baby. Oh, that's so beautiful. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, can we hang out? You know, right. oh, do you want to come over and watch the footy? Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, my son, he can look after your dog while you're away. No problems. I, I, and we were just we're blown away by right. the stark mm. contrast. And one of the amazing things that you that I, you notice, you might work in the city, for example, um, and you walk past, I don't know, you might walk past thousands of people a day, mm. potentially, especially if you move a lot in the, in the busy times, morning peak, lunchtime, afternoon peak. Mm. And how many people do you make eye contact with? Mm. That's how actually people, dangerous making eye to- contact in some strange, cases. Yeah. How many yeah. people do you nod good morning to or mm. hello to? I would say next to zero. Yeah, and See, in the because, country because yeah, I'm the, from yeah, the country, yeah. I make eye contact with people, yeah. mm. and the reason I know it's dangerous is it often gets me into trouble. Mm. <laughs> but mostly, it just makes people freaked out. They're going, <laughs> yeah. Who, "Who's this guy? Why is he making eye contact? <laughs> well, yeah, right. What have I done? Is he an <laughs> undercover policeman? Like, <laughs> honestly, or, or it, does, it, is he going to follow me? Or, you know, there's some people who check behind them to make sure I'm not walking <laughs> in their right. direction. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> but contrast that then to our experience then in in, in the Blue Mountains. Everyone says, good morning, right. hello, mm. how are you going? You stop on the, uh, It will take us 25 minutes to walk 200 metres mm. because we are stopped constantly walking up right. a hill, pushing a pram or See, something like that. some people would say that that's actually a definition of hell. I mean, it's hell is other people coming. <laughs> <laughs> when they go home, they don't want to be engaged with other people. And this is interesting because in the city life, we've almost become deliberately in- insulated. Like uh, my wife and I have a habit when we move in or when anyone else moves into our street, we take them a cake or mm. go and introduce them. We give mm. them our numbers to say, if we're too noisy, call the number. We're happy to hear from you just to give us an indication we want to be good neighbours. And we never hear from them. Like we just, they, they almost deliberately avoid us. Mm. And, and yet when we move out, they go, oh, you're going. You're such good neighbours. <laughs> we, we, we tried to be, but you just simply don't let us can't see words. Peter is raising his arms, looking <laughs> exasperated. <laughs> you know. but what I'm interested in taking a box into this conversation is you've had experience in, in quite different cultures. In particular, mm. I'm interested in the Philippines side yep. of things because yep. that's a bit more crowded generally yes. than Australia. <laughs> a <laughs> little more. <laughs> so yeah. if you're surrounded by these people, is it the same sort of thing that in crowded circumstances you don't tend to? Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost a fear there of, okay. you know you don't know what this person does or who they are you know don't mm. talk to people don't look at them um uh, does that change it, when you get into the country areas yeah i mean look i i grew up several months of every year in in the country in the philippines and and the town that we were part of was just a normal town but over the last two decades it's become a large town okay and then a small city and and now a city it went to the from the situation where we knew all of the old families that lived there. We knew everyone there. You'd say mm-hmm. hi, you know, there's the baker. There, you know, you go off for your morning breakfast. To now we don't know half the people there. Right. And yet we still have the connections with all the bigger families. Right. So uh, it's still not as bad as, let's say, Manila. Yep. Where you just wouldn't look anyone in the eye. Right. Uh, it's funny that you, you mentioned that earlier because this morning on the way in to the city, I bumped into two or three people on the street. <laughs> and eye contact, right. said good morning, got on the train, came to the city, and no one would look at me right. as I'm walking down the street trying to say hi to people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It, it, it's that very striking mm. difference. Now, as we used to drive through the country, when I learned to drive, part of my lessons of learning to drive in my home country town was that as we went past friends' houses, we had to toot just to say hi. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it would be a specific toot for each house. So there's did it for the Aitkins. And as you went past um, this other house around this corner, as you were going around the corner, you had to go dit, 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 dit. And, <laughs> and then as we went through it, and if we only did one toot, we'd get a call when we got home. What have we done? 
Like, <laughs> what's, what's, what, have we offended you in some way? Because it, it was this interaction which was expected. It was like a ritual. What's your experience of the country in terms of greeting people and knowing people? Oh, gosh, just all these crazy people saying hello to you. It's great. I, I love it. I'm, I'm a bit of an extrovert. We were actually visited um, Lismore in the last week or so, and my husband's a lot more introverted than I am. Like, he's actually <laughs> came from the city. You know, it's such a different experience for him. Right. But um, it's great. Like people just will say hello and just start up a conversation. And you also, it does. It doesn't feel. Um, I don't know. It doesn't feel like you have to have a, like a really close friendship with them or anything like that. And like you know, commit almost. But mm. you, you have a very friendly exchange. And you go away and you just feel a bit like kind of yeah uh, propped up a little bit, which that is was wonderful. nice. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah. It's it's and it's like just very. I think because people are so relaxed as well. Like right. you. It's sort of a bug you catch with each other as well as this kind of relaxed sort of feeling, which mm-hmm. I, I always think is wonderful. And then, you know, like wave at each other in the car, like sort of similar sort of thing. Like, you know, let someone through and it's just like, yeah, mate, you know, like a <laughs> quick wave and all that stuff. So, and then I think as well, we um we had, um my husband was like, oh, why is that guy flashing me in the middle of the day? And I'm like, there's a cop car up the head. <laughs> it's all these little, like, it's kind of sort of its own culture in itself. Yes, it's like yep. its own mm. language. So, yeah. Yeah, if I, bro- I'm, I frequently broke down. My first car was a really old car and, and oh, no. it frequently broke down in the country. And it would, a number of people would stop and offer you help and everything. And they would be insulted if you offered them money or, or a payback or a beer mm. or something. Mm. Um, unless you met them in the pub and you say, oh, let me buy you a beer for the, for the help, then they'd be okay with it. But it was it was like an insulting thing. This is what neighbours do. This is what people do. Mm. Even if I don't know you very well, this neighbourhood is something I'm invested in. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. However, the big feeling when we moved to the country, my father was a, an educated man according to the country standards. He had a degree. <laughs> in fact, he had a teaching degree on top of his degree. And so he was the only guy in town with a degree and he had moved from the city. And more importantly, his work wasn't on the land. So we were surrounded by dairy farmers Uh, and beef farmers and, you know, crops and all that sort of thing. And the people who weren't into that were in the power stations and the the coal mines that were in in southeast Victoria. So you were either the kind of the minor sector set or you were in the um the sort of the farming set and he was the city slicker who came to live there and he had a little 10 acre block so he was almost held with a kind of amused um patronizing sort of <laughs> 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 looked at him in that way and that so the, the locals um and even after we'd been there for a good you know 18 years we were still not locals really because we, we didn't have land we didn't have family we were sort of ring-ins there was a different set to it. And I, I don't know if that exists anymore because the, the, the farms have gotten bigger and bigger and much more corporate. Um, I haven't been back. Have you, you've been back recently, obviously, Beth. Yeah. But do you think so the country life has changed um, with the changes in farming? and and? Yeah. Lismore has changed a bit. It's sort of become more of a cafe culture, which has kind of mm. been quite interesting. Right. Um, we visited Byron Bay and that was really interesting, actually, because it's become incredibly... It's like Glebe on the beach. Like, <laughs> it's so interesting. That's a selling point. Yeah, I know, right? I know. <laughs> they use that as their tourist, tourist slogan. I know. It's funny. I was talking to my father-in-law about it last night, and he's like, these people, they never take off their shoes at Byron Bay, which you should be doing. It's Byron Bay, you know, because it's, um, you know, he said, I just remember the flip-flops and the, like, you know, mm. the shirt and everything. But it, And he's right. Like, you kind of go there, and there's, like, you, you start paying Sydney prices again for the cafe. It's like good food and everything. But um, then you see superfoods like the chia berries and stuff. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> Activated <laughs> fermented vegetables. <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. And it was, but it was funny because you still got like Byron Bay kebabs, which we used to go to as kids. But it was a really relaxed sort of environment. But the city sort of started to encroach on it, I guess, or this culture from the city that's come across. Mm. And that was really quite interesting to see, especially as an adult. And I'm just like, this is so different. Like, Byron Bay was quite famous for keeping McDonald's and KFC and all of that sort of stuff out. Like I think the worst they did was, you know, Subway. Right. So they they still don't have those, but it's still it's gotten in there in another way. It's really interesting. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that the things I missed in the country was the company, so that there weren't as many people around. Mm. And if you didn't, like my the religious group I grew up in didn't let me play sports, so I wasn't in the local sports team. So it basically meant I'd missed an entire part of the culture so i had my church culture and not much else so Mm. but what you you went down to the the general store and if the general store wasn't open you couldn't buy anything Mm. so you you literally you had to get along with the general store owner because 
if you didn't, you mm. know, where are you going to buy stuff? You couldn't <laughs> buy anything. And there was one petrol station for, you know, for yeah. 30 minutes drive in any direction. In some parts of Victoria, there are signs up which say um, there's no petrol beyond this point. And so not not there's no petrol for 30 miles or something. If you keep going on this road, there's no petrol. So you basically, you have to get the local store or the lo- if there's a bakery, mm. Hooray, it's a big town. Um, but basically you've got one. You have to get along with the baker. There's an internet um, essay which t- is titled, um, I better be careful here, but I think it's called Why We Need or We Need More Annoying People. <laughs> okay. And, and the, the argument is in a country town, <laughs> in a country town you have to get along with the locals. Yep. You have no choice. Mm. They're weird, they're different, some of them are annoying, but you just get along with them because you have to. Because you want to buy bread, or you mm. want to buy, mm. um, you want to go to the the supermarket, or you want to go to they probably aren't supermarkets, but um, you want to go to the petrol station or something. And the guy pumping gas is the same guy you're going to see every time you go there. Yeah. Mm. And because you have to get along with them, you just make make do, even if they're yeah. annoying. You just deal mm. with it. You you and often in country life, I remember a couple of um, kids who had special needs in our in our culture then. They, people just adjusted around them. Mm. They didn't have special places for them or anything. Mm. Everyone just knew them and they mm. just worked around them. You know, they just they did what they could do. Someone gave them something to do and then uh, the rest of us moved around that. That's um, awesome. It's, it's a funny thing because in the city, it's not just Facebook and social media that we're able to shut people out. You're in a house and you don't have to interact with your neighbours. Right. Mm. So you end up, the pay, only people you interact with are the people you choose to interact with at the times and places you choose to interact with them. That's right. so, yeah. yeah. So can I then ask what's the what was the what was the driver of the argument? Why we need more annoying people? So I just wanted you to finish off that. Well the because point. because most of the time people are annoying. Full stop. Right? Even your best friends get annoying. Mm-hmm. And if we don't develop the capacity to cope with little annoying habits and and in other words be a little bit flexible around other mm-hmm. people uh, and deal with things that don't quite work for us, then we actually lose the entire capacity to appreciate the good things in someone's uh, personality. Mm. And also, we we actually lose the com- literally community. Right. Because mm. community is not just when I feel like being entertained by you or spending a recreational time with you. Community is when I'm actually low, when I need help, yeah. when mm. I'm messy, when I'm not sociable, when I'm actually not easy to get along with. I need my community then. Yeah. Not just when I'm at my best. And we kind of have a culture, I think, in the city where we retreat into our little homes where we're ugly and we kind of let our hair down and be ugly. And there's a problem there because ugliness then transfers in some cases into quite nasty home situations. Yeah. But when we come out, we kind of feel like we have to present the absolute best kind of like our presentation, self-presentation on social mm-hmm. media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We present the absolute best. We choose the times and places and we go out and be those things and then we come retreat back into home and be ugly again kind of thing. Yeah, mm. and you know what the antidote to that is in the city? It's Catholic community. Right. Christian community. Like I think of, you know, there's a few people I've probably annoyed <laughs> 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 and who annoy me and I have to see them regularly in, in certain like, you know, at particular parishes or like on uh, on the Catholic circuit, you know. Right. <laughs> and that means that I have to adjust to them and they have to adjust to me because you have to see each other again. Yep. And it's really interesting. It's sort of like that's really the, that antidote in the city is to have that community that glues you together. Like you have to be at this building yes, at least like once a week. Right. And mm. you have to see them. So it's really interesting actually. Yeah. At the same time though, I think we're also spoilt there. I mean, it's very much in the small town we're in. What one parish for the for the city now, I guess, and mm. and you know everyone knows each other because they go to that. And there's it's small enough that we only have the set group. So I oh, very much yeah. agree. But here in the city, here in Sydney, I know some people that just didn't get along with some people in one group, so they just started going to another parish, oh, okay. or they started jumping groups as well. So and conf- confession time, I drive quite a distance to go to my parish on a Sunday. <laughs> um, it's about a twenty-minute drive, and it's along a, a reasonably good road in Sydney, so it's a you know it's a fair distance. It's a fair say. distance, mm-hmm. and I, I I once tried to count how many parishes I go past to get mm. there. <laughs> so it's perhaps a, a subject for a whole other podcast, <laughs> but potentially on local but, parishes. <laughs> but the reason I've done that is the community. So I went to my mm-hmm. local place, and I've attempted to engage with the community, and it's simply not. 
they're not allowing it. They're not yeah. pushing it. They're not. Um, they're not. There's not that same sort of leeway. And I guess I, in coming from the country, I'm very conscious about that. And also, there's the kind of the ex-Protestant thing where Protestants are very communal after their their worship services. Mm-hmm. There's good and bad in that, and we'll explore that in another podcast. But um, I looked for a strong community around a strong Catholic mm-hmm. faith, and, and in a sense, that's it's been a good thing to to find that home and go there. And it's interesting in the city, though as Box was intimating, you travel to a community and you hang out, you end up choosing a community. Yep. And it's interesting that people are gravitating much more to sports clubs and, you know, like Rotary or, or various other clubs as their identity. Mm-hmm. And if they're not, what tends to happen is that they tend to really get feistily into internet sort of groups. Uh, as mm. in people who stepping back half a half a step there, Peter, I, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but wouldn't there be a justification based on the article that you brought up, the argument for we need more annoying people? Yep. Wouldn't your parish that you your local parish that you're not going to need you? <laughs> yes. Annoying yep. as you are. Yes. <laughs> and all your family, you know, dragged along. You know, like wouldn't like what? what it's a good what argument. Do do about that? It is a good argument, Cormac. And if I was um. If I was a single man, I would probably take that argument and go my hardest. Mm. Um, and I am exceptionally talented at being annoying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to say modestly that I would have a significant contribution in the annoying stakes. Mm. Um, and I'm not a I'm not an easy person to get along with generally um, because I'm I don't do small talk. I don't like small talk. I don't enjoy it at all. I like to talk about things that are in, in interesting mm. and deep and, and meaningful and actually have some substance. And that makes most people who are wandering around half awake on a Sunday morning quite nervous about <laughs> being anywhere <laughs> near me because I might talk about <laughs> something that I don't want to think about at this time. Mm. But in terms of um, getting on with friends, uh, I have to say a huge number of my very good friends that have over many years – have been initially quite difficult people to deal with for various circumstances or just clashes of personality. Mm -hmm. And once you've actually made the point of looking past the initial um, discord or the initial annoyance, you actually find there's something quite deep and interesting in every person. Mm -hmm. And if you have the time, and especially when someone's um, uh, underappreciated, if you look deeper, you can often find really good friendships in those situations. And I think that was the point of his article, that you don't actually find real friends until someone knows your annoying habits and looks past them and sees the value, not not just in spite of those things, but actually they come to value the weirdness mm, right. that is. But your reasoning like. is that this, yeah, you would give it more time, but because of the the obligations you have on for your family to raise them well in, in faith and in a good community, you yeah. say, well, I actually have to put these yeah, it's first n- as my immediate priority. It's not right? just that there's a lack of um, uh, community in some of these things. It's actually the, there's a certain toxicity in some yes. communities. And yeah, so right. uh, yeah. when I'm raising a family, some of the quest, some of the things I have to think about is who, who, what, what village am I raising mm, them in? Because right. the, it takes a village to raise a child. What village am I choosing for my child? Now in the country, uh, you can't choose that, but you can move to a different town if there's a toxic environment. In the city, you're choosing your village in a different way. I'm just not sure we're being as deliberate about it as we would we should be. And I think Beth raised a point earlier about Catholic culture. It's almost ad hoc. It, we gather around things almost incidentally, either because it's an issue or it's a location or it's a mm. happens to be an organisation of a particular event. Mm. And Catholics have done that in the past. Like we parishes have been not necessarily gathered around. Let's have a community. Mm. They've been in the Saint Vincent de Paul Society or you know, the the Legion of Mary or, you know, the Antioch youth groups or whatever. Attending theology on tap in <laughs> Sydney, for example. <laughs> oh my gosh, well, no, but it is. And this yeah. is this is the interesting point is that a lot of the, uh, and this is what perhaps we can talk about in terms of the the opportunities for, for formation, for community in mm-hmm. the city versus the country and the way it expresses So what are the advantages itself? of being in the city? Absolutely. Is, mm. you know, is the fact that, you know, large populations can uh, gather more momentum and put mm. on larger scale events, attract, yep. you know, for example, high scale speakers from mm. overseas. To Which presumes that large scale events are actually a good thing. I think, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, we could make the case that they do offer benefit. I mm. mean, for example, World Youth Day is a large-scale event. Fair enough. And you probably wouldn't have seen that gathered by a country diocese just by sheer yeah. um, uh, capacity mm. to organise things and things That's like right. that. That's right. There are those out there, I will say, as a quick disclaimer, that don't like World Youth Day. Right? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I'm sorry to you people, but <laughs> I think it's a good thing. Sorry, Box. I mean, I, look, I... 
I remember at, at before World Youth Day was a big thing in Australia, there was a real struggle for youth groups that weren't part of a movement. So they weren't, you know, okay. part of Antioch or anything. And I, I remember being part of youth groups that struggled with that. And um, after World Youth Day uh, became such a big thing for us that, you know, there was a real, I guess, a, a, activation <laughs> of, of youth groups in the diocese. Now, the problem was is, is that over the last 10, 15 years, I've seen that there's a, a movement away from the, the weekly or monthly youth group or community in the parish to become more of a, an event-based thing. Yep. Mm. And I think having one instead of, the, uh, instead of the other is problematic. I think they need to work together. Mm. And I, I think it reflects that whole uh, country versus city thing you know, having having a group that you can connect with on a regular basis, you can talk about your problems, mm. you can talk about things that irritate you or your struggles, yeah. and then go to going to an event, um, having been nourished and, yeah. and formed in a community. There's something liturgical about community, yeah. as in if you're regularly in contact with someone, so mm. every Friday night I'm doing this with these guys, is is like clockwork and it doesn't have to be a big event, and therefore I feel like I can raise address things which aren't related to the events, the so-called event, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, I wonder, I mean, this is something a bit more controversial. I think this, what I've noticed in the city as opposed to the country is that cities tend to divide people up into categories. Yeah. Like you get into a city church, they want to have the youth group, they want to have the, the elderly group, they want to have the, mm. uh, the young mums, they want to have... In, in the country, you just, maybe it's just because you don't have the numbers, but you just get together. Like mm. there was, there's, a, there's the thing on at the parish uh, or when I was in, in Adelaide, one of the nearly country parishes basically said all right we're, we we need some more um communion wine so everyone got the bus ready i'm thinking <laughs> what and then the next week the bus turns up to church everyone walks out of the the church service gets on the bus and they go up into the barossa and and have a wine tasting <laughs> <laughs> day where they select <laughs> they select the port for the communion wine for the next. Cup of so <laughs> that was not catholic that was lutheran <laughs> or was yeah. it no but adelaide is a town <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but um, well, yeah, Catholics can't do that because we need specific wines mm. to to meet the material requirements oh, yes, of, of the sacraments. Yeah. But the point is, is that it's it's very organic, and the whole community is together. There's not this artificial separation of ages and and sexes and mm. and you know different groups because you just everyone's in. So when you had lunch after after church, you you weren't. I mean, the young people did tend to hang out with young people, but you also had conversations with older mm. people and younger people because, and I think that actually made you a better person mm. because we have the capacity to have that interaction. I've seen young people who are very sociable in their own year level mm. at school because they're very used to that and they know how to deal with authority at teachers, but when they get go to like an old folks home or to look after younger kids, they just don't know how to interact with people who aren't in their same worldview right. and, and, and current you know, stage in life, mm. which is an interesting thing. I don't know if that's peculiar to the country, but I have noticed it in the country. I learned, I had to learn how to do that right. as well, living in the Philippines. And I mean, we Did were they connected. separate the ages in the Philippines? Well, no, not really. I mean, we had just people, everyone drop in okay. to, the, to the house. My, my grandma taught basically everyone in the village. And, you know, <laughs> everyone's brothers or sisters were friends with my uncles and aunties because there were so many of them. Right. Mm. Uh, and as was mentioned before in a previous podcast, I was raised by my uncles and aunties, my grandmother as well as my mum. So right. I was raised by a village within a village. Wow. And yeah, having to learn to get along with people regardless right. of how much they annoyed you. I, I don't see that a lot in a lot of my young Catholic friends. Yeah, that might be a big family, small family thing too. Mm, like that's I've true. noticed even though my kids are all city kids, I have eight kids, so they have to get along, right? Because it's a, not a, not as big a house as, as would be ideal. It's a great house, um, but they have to get along. And mm. we've noticed that when they go hang around with other people, they're better at getting along with people who are slightly more difficult just because they had to get along with people. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, someone who's um, not experienced that in their own home has to learn some other way. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's different in the country because you have, still have to get along with people because they're the only ones around. But I think also in the, the countries, sorry, um, also uh, – they're not as stressed out about having big families mm. compared to in the city. There's a lot of push to having a small family later in life. Right. Mm. Um, as in big families don't stress them out in the country. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, know, you look dubious over there, Beth. <laughs> oh, no, it's so funny because I um, told my – like, so my in-laws are all quite secular and it's so funny Box says that because I – at my bridal shower, I sort of said, oh, yeah, I want seven kids. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Good luck living in the city. And I'm like, well, 
move if I could, but you know, it's <laughs> mm. I just thought it was so funny. But I mean, you know, like I mean, how many kids do you have, Peter? Eight. Eight. I mean, mm. you know, you've made it work and stuff. It's so funny. I don't think people have enough kind of um confidence in themselves mm. to adapt. Mm. Like humans are amazing. It's fear of the unknown to a mm. large extent. Yeah, um because right. I think this would be the case in the country now because even when we were kids, we had five kids in my, f like I was one of five. And I think even then people looked at us a little bit strangely and, and you know, all these weirdos with lots of kids. Um, my dad was one of 12. Wow. So uh, he didn't think it was strange to have five. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny when people don't know a situation, they yeah. just make, they have this sort of assumption that they have and there's nothing to disprove them. They haven't seen a functioning family um, mm -hmm. And often when, when I grew up and uh, people in the city who had lots of kids tended to be stereotyped into the, you know, the, the mum who'd had many kids to different fathers uh -huh. and there was a kind of a stigma attached to it. And so a question my wife still gets when she goes to the supermarket, all the same father? Like she, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've heard the same thing too, right? Because really? I, so I'm one of 11, my wife's one of nine children, but uh, my brothers and I used to walk along and we're one of those interesting families where not not many of us look all that much like each other <laughs> and, and so we're walking along and we're, we're well <laughs> look i the disclaimer i'm the only child in my family with red hair mm. okay you know and it, mm. uh, and at first glance you might go oh, okay they mm. mates you know walking down together yeah. they're all different ages mm. but one woman stopped us uh my brother and i in in surrey hills which is in the city of, uh, of sydney and and she goes oh you guys mates you know like, i don't know we're brothers she goes oh yeah different fathers eh <laughs> <laughs> no it's just like and I, I was maybe 11 or 12 at the time and so i just said yes <laughs> <laughs> um, well see in the country you can you can get away with a lot of stuff because people remember like and this is the thing in the country that most city people can't get their head around everything you say and do in the country matters mm. and that's part of the thing that gets a little bit freaky if you're not used to it everything you say if it has any significance at all will go around yep. and you'll hear back you can't just be nasty to someone but you also can't tell a lie because it's going to come back around the community mm, yeah. it, you know everything you say and do matters now that's a good thing if if you know that means you're not wasting um you know your efforts to be a good person etc right. but it's it can be a bad thing uh, sometimes it's poisonous because you annoy the wrong person and it becomes a problem but most of the time it just simply cultivates uh, what what sometimes been referred to as country manners, which are actually a, a, just a good habit of yeah. making sure you don't poison the water. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, but I am glad you raised this, raised this point because it has been on my mind and I was looking for a right Do you mean country manners? Or? No, well, country manners, is uh, this, that's a new term and it's the first time <laughs> I'm hearing of it. But I wonder, is there a point uh, within the, the country scene predominantly where too much community can be a problem? Yeah. Uh, I'm Absolutely. wondering this because I, I, you, you hear of... of uh, taboo words like scandal or things like that, okay. where yep. a rumor circulates. It might be true, it might be false, but you 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 like playing a game of Chinese yeah. whispers. Well, you know, I can you tell whisper you one thing to a person, and then by the time it goes around the whole room, it's a completely That's different right. narrative. Mm. And and that I want to ask you guys: is too much community? Is there such a thing as too much community, and how can it be problematic? It can be, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of anecdotes on that level. And perhaps Beth, if you can chime in on this one. In my community, we, we, as I said, we weren't connected with the sports set. So I interacted with them in schools and other places like the shops and things, but we never actually hung out with them on weekends because they would play sport and drink lots of beer and, get, and fall around drunk and that wasn't our thing. So we would go to church on Sunday and go home and do our thing. But And then the church circle in particular was very close-knit and it worked really well in some ways. So, for example, when a, a young lady in our neighborhood her husband left her ran off um with her with her sister so it's it's it was a hor look a scandal but i mm. only found out about it because someone pulled up with a, a, a one of the old big tray tray ute things and said jump in and you know all the guys he was just going on the country road and we all jumped in and we went round to her house and we just chopped every bit of wood in sight and cleaned the entire garden and we did everything and we did this about once a month for the next year and i asked what's going on? Why are we doing this for this particular? Mm. Oh, and he said, oh, she's just, you know, husband's not around to do it. And th there was nothing said from the guy's mm. point of view. Now I hear later that the women were less um, complimentary. So they went to console her and it was very gossipy. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. she she ended up leaving the community because she couldn't hack it. Now the guys, however, just did stuff because they just yeah. rallied around the need itself. Now in my case, I've experienced it on the receiving end because my mum and dad separated while I was still in the country mm. zone, and it became quite. Um, I wasn't actually living at home when they physically separated, but it was building up to it as we were getting there. And mum went to a different church, which was much more scandalous than, than actually separating from marriage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, right. and, but the, we couldn't, like I couldn't go back to that church and not get looked at strangely, you know what I mean? So once I'd sort of done something which put me outside of the general circle that I was in, I couldn't go back there. And in the city that happens a lot still, but people just stop going to that group and go yeah, to a different right. group. Yeah, Well, and that's partly our experience. Oh, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. Do you want to no, no, finish that's, that's your about story? It. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and this is where I've got to own up to uh, a little disclaimer. I didn't mean to put you on the spot earlier around, oh, why don't you go to your local parish? Mm. We don't either, or at least we didn't. We had a, a local parish that we, we went to and we found and we tried, like we had, um, yeah, I won't delve too much into the story, but basically we had parishioners chasing my wife out of the church almost oh, wow. because she wanted to go to confession. Oh, dear. And Ooh. they thought, no, no. Oh, shocking. You, yeah. Shocking. That, oh. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the ladies went up to her and told her, oh, uh, uh, after she basically had to barge away into the sacristy to get access to the priest because there were people blocking it. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Mass starts on time here. Oh, we don't, we don't, you know, mm. you don't, don't you dare interrupt our schedule kind of thing. And then, you know, she comes out and she's able to, the priest's like, oh, of course, come to confession. That's fine. And as she's leaving, someone calls out after her, oh, you're happy. You're holier than the rest of us now, are you? Oh, wow. <laughs> like, and so we were there going, well, yeah. All right. Well, maybe, maybe there's not going to be a, mm. much of a welcoming committee for us well, here anymore. One, yeah. one person is not a community though. Um, and I'm not saying that that's that's not the experience of that particular parish but often the loudest people and the first it's fun, something someone told me when I was first a minister the first interaction you have is almost always not indicative of the rest because it's the squeakiest wheel the loudest person the most intrusive person mm. isn't representative of the rest mm. because most people sit back and wait before they engage mm. with you like especially in the country people don't come out looking for you unless there's a need obvious you tend to come across them as you plod through through life. And the person who does come and get in your face is usually the town busybody who you more or less just go, okay, you're that person. The I'm yenta. Just, I'm just going to be very, <laughs> for those that have seen Fiddler on the Roof, <laughs> I'm just going to be really careful what I say to you and then hopefully meet the rest of the people sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, in best experience uh, with community and in particular the, the good and bad of that particular intense community of the country. Yeah, it's sort of interesting. I um, I mean, this is a bit of a dark story in a way, I suppose, but a close family friend of ours um, had passed away and we sort of had intimate knowledge of what had happened. Right. And unfortunately, a relative of this close family friend had decided to tell everyone it was suicide. Oh, dear. Which was, it was awful. Like, she, I think she was and, a bit, and it wasn't, is it what you're saying? It was not suicide, okay. no, but yeah. I think she got quite a little bit, like, out of control and started right. telling a lot of people in... in in Lismore that happened. I had no idea until about a year later when I went to visit um, an old school teacher of mine who was close to this um, family friend. And she was in tears, like, going, oh, you know, yeah. is this what happened? Yep. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, please tell as many people as you can mm. that this is not what happened. Because mm, right. I just lo- looked at her distressed and I thought, wow, how many people would be feeling this distressed about this person? Because yes. there's a real, like, you know, there's obviously a real bond. And when suicide happens, it really... It's something that ripples out. It's very distressing to people, even if you're not that close. Like yes. it really, there's something really gets in deep there. Yeah. So I tried to kind of turn, like, I think that commu- that close community is a natural state of hum- humanity, really. Right. Um, so I tried to kind of turn it back on itself and use use it for good in a way yeah. and try and, like, get it well, out. you had the relationship, whereas yeah. in the city, if a story spreads, it's how did you even address it? Yeah. You can't yeah. stop it. In, in normal ways, I guess. Whereas That's in the country, right. there's still, I mean, there were some false uh, rumours spread when my mum and dad separated. Yeah. And I remember being able to address them. I was very distressed at the time because the story mm. was spreading and it affected my capacity to interact with people. But I was able to say, That's false. Yeah. Here's the, the good oil. And then they would go, Oh, okay. And because we had a prior relationship, you were able to cut it off because mm. they trusted you to that's talk right. directly You're a to the face. Source. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I remember the, the small town we were. Uh, I grew up in in the Philippines. Uh, 
everyone knew each other's parents and, and children. So, you know, I, if, I if know you, your mother. Yeah, if you were caught out doing something, they were like, don't think I'm gonna not going to tell your mum about this. Or, you know, and, and oftentimes I'd be out doing something. Uh, one of my friends would do something, not me. So I <laughs> would be doing something wrong. And almost before we got back, they'd already heard about what we'd done. Right. Um, and I think on the other side of that as well, I mean, that, that was a positive thing, but, but also not the other side. But, um, also when it comes to faith, Right. Um, I think there was a lot of encouragement there from the communities oh, okay. that we had. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when, when I started to look into my faith more seriously after I, I uh, turned 18, uh, being connected with the people in the community, I was directed um, into the right groups. into the, Right. And, and, and people could look out for each other, you know, or have you, I haven't seen this person mm. for two weeks in a row. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we could go check, out, check right. up on them and, and things like that. So, yeah. There's definitely that positive element, but it's just when it becomes gossip, yeah, yeah. it becomes the the negative. Uh, but that's still about human who the, who the human beings involved are. Mm. So I mean, for instance, there's a particular um, group of people, not not an indiv- not a specific group, but there are certain individuals who always sit in front of us in mass, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. and when they don't show up, we're asking Father. Do you know where you know so and so is? Yeah. Are they okay? Can we get them something? You know that sort of thing, yeah. and. It can be a community. You, you don't have to have Facebook to have a community. And mm. I think it's probably better if you don't. Um, it's an interesting thing. What about the social media thing? Do you think it's robbing us of this interaction with people, especially the fact that we can block or choose when we interact? Mm, that's interesting, yeah. I think the way I, I – it really depends on how you use it. I see social media as a tool. Um, I find it really useful – for being in touch with them. Um, I have like a, a bit of a group chat and we yep. share memes and do stupid things together. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but we also have quite interesting discussions. Like I had a, I had something I was trying to figure out, like I was trying to introspect on whether I'd done the right thing and I was able to send it to them and kind of get a bit of feedback. Yep, yep. But I know these people in real life. Yes. And we do. But see, that's the social media enhancing a real relationship. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's not, or facilitating a real relationship. It's not actually a relationship which is solely social media. Right? That's right. I think... You know, it's almost like liturgically in a way. You need yeah. to meet up with them. We meet up maybe mm. once a month, once every two months. Sure. It's been very useful in the last like six weeks while I've been sick with like morning sickness. <laughs> like I just <laughs> can lie in bed and just chat to them and have a bit of a social interaction, especially when my husband's been at work and stuff and I've just got the cat. So mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like she gives, she's, you know. Can the I cats aren't so the most stuff? selfless example <laughs> of, <right>. uh, <laughs> of love. That's right. So um, I'm not a cat person. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I... I think, I mean, it's not great when you're, it's just like literally about building a a brand of yourself. And I think when your interactions are merely shallow, but I also think it's great for galvanizing a community and things. Um, and, but again, you need that, you really need that glue of real interaction and a mm. real community underneath yep. it. Um, I found it very useful for galvanizing um, Catholic community and things like that. Mm, yeah. But again, you've got to see people face to face. My dad used to always say, you know, belly to belly. It's yeah. the most important, you know, <laughs> yep. it's like, which is like pretty, a pretty good, um, I think it was. Uh, That's that a very was, country image though. It is actually. <laughs> and it's funny because he grew up in the city. I just was imagining yeah. sumo wrestling. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, it was not a well, pleasant image. Can I, can I push this a little bit and say um, the country thing is an interesting thing, especially now when the government's looking at how to, to push immigration mm. into the, the mm. regional areas. I'm not sure that regional, I mean, regional is an interesting thing as far as infrastructure, but when, mm-hmm. this isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about communities. If we put a lot of people somewhere else, all we've done is moved the infrastructure. We haven't actually changed the culture. This, this discussion is really about the culture of persons. It's possible to have um, a culture within a street. Like there was yeah, one absolutely. place I lived um, where we actually had a good relationship with the neighbours and we, you know, there was a kind of a court and we mm. had a, a really good friendship with people. Um, and even with our landlord as well, there was a good relationship with the landlord. But there, there are many Catholics at the moment, or not many, there are some Catholics at the moment who are promoting this idea called the Benedict Option, which is to sort of remove yourself from secular society, almost like the Essenes in the, in the biblical times mm. or the monastic communities. Culture is too corrupt and bad, and so we're going to go and live in the country somewhere, mm. away from this whole thing. Um, is that something that's going to solve the problem as far as Catholics are concerned, or is it that big a deal that we need to do that? Or is there a way that Catholics can get more active in country life, or perhaps bring that the good things about country community into the city? Well, is that the whole thesis? I mean, I have not. I'll 
confess, not read the Benedict option, but from what I understand, part of the the options available to you yep. is when you, you kind of move to the country to galvanize your own virtue, sense of community, right. learn the country way, if you like, mm. and then might be able one day to bring that back in. I don't think he's going for a life. particular culture in the country. I think that he's looking to create a Catholic culture. Okay, so yeah. it's not about coming back and re-evangelizing yeah. or whatever. It's yeah. more about separate yourself and just run a parallel kind yeah. of mm. lifestyle. Well, well, I think in in Australia in particular is a good example of the difference between creating your own culture in an iso- a slightly more isolated area and actually being in the country. Because in the country there were elements like the drunkenness every single Saturday after mm. the football match, which weren't pretty. And if you weren't into that scene and you didn't like violence and and promiscuity etc that happened during that drunkenness you simply didn't you couldn't go near it and you just basically stayed away from certain areas Mm -hmm. but it was it was identifiable and definable and you could choose your when and how you interacted with people but the rod dreyer is it that wrote the benedict Mm. option his his thesis seems to be that he wants to deliberately create a culture that you want to be in Mm. now i put to you that the whole idea of we need more annoying people um is almost opposed to that idea that we actually need people who are different i need friends who aren't catholic um firstly because they're worth knowing they're good (laughs) there's Mm. there's a goodness in it but also they challenge me in Mm. in am i just kind of getting atrophied into a particular way of living everything about my life and my choices and my attitude should be challenged by friends who aren't necessarily agreeing with me and that actually makes me a much better person in terms of our promoting pro- promotion of community, though, are there, what are some ways we can actually bring that kind of country feel? And I'm using country feel in the most idealistic sense here. That's right. Of genuinely looking out for others in our community. Of the whole, you know, if you break down on the side of the road, someone stops to help, you know, sort of thing. Uh, I was actually thinking that uh, one of the things we, or at least I haven't experienced mu- much of in terms of, uh, I mean, my close friends have it, but we don't seem to invest ourselves in other people's lives. Right. Uh, at in, least, w- in what way do you mean? I mean, for example, uh, having a, a party or an event on Facebook these days, you know, you go, you know, who's coming? Almost everyone will click interested. Right. <laughs> and, 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 which, and, which is non-committal. Basically. Yeah, non-committal. <laughs> As in, me, I want to so see sorry. if there's another thing that comes up that's more interesting yeah. for me. And, and it's just also how we options go. open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's also the same way we, a, a lot of, what I've seen in, in uh, different communities, people will attend mass because it's the bare minimum. They might even check their phone during the mass or whatever because I'm here, I'm doing the bare minimum. But they're not actually investing themselves. They're not opening themselves up right. to participate in not only the mass but other people's lives. And I think when we, we have that distinction, when we have that separation, then that's a big falling out of what it is to actually be a human person right. and participating in community. Mm. And and if once we do participate as Catholics, that's when we can actually, I guess, evangelize or, you know, God can work through us because people will see, hang on, I like that this person does this. Mm. Why don't I do this? And mm. just leading by example, I guess. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot, Box. And it also ties in, I think, that keyword investing. Uh, I think, Peter, you also mentioned a similar term uh, in your comments earlier. The idea that, you know, and this is an example of something, a really small thing that I try and do uh, is, uh, I think, fostering and not necessarily just being Catholic, but as Catholics, how do you engage with non-Catholics in your street, for example, fostering Mm. a sense of neighborliness, checking in on how your neighbors are going, at least even saying good morning or can, Mm. you know, uh, for example, we uh, in our street have single parents and things like that. Oh, I'll take your bins out, that kind of thing. Uh, And a little thing I try and do um, is uh, we often find uh, a bit of rubbish on the street and you walk past and I'll pick it up and I'll put it in, it might be the neighbor's bin or something like that, just mm. as a bin I'm walking past, because I am a stakeholder right. in the land that I live in. Mm. Right. And mm. I have a sense of responsibility mm. for not stewardship or at least go caring for what, you know, what I, and I, I don't own that land and it's not yep. my rubbish. And I could say, yeah, not my problem, yep. uh, which we often see in the city. How many times you've walked past just an empty chip packet or yep. cigarette butts that are floating around. But if there's a loose bit of, you know, yeah. you know newspaper or whatever flying around, I go, no, no this is my community yep. and that includes the land as well. And yeah. so I've got a responsibility to look after that. So what does that look like in persons? Because it's all very well to talk about rubbish picking up, mm-hmm. but when we're picking up the rubbish of other people's lives, 
that costs a little bit more than just bending down and throwing something in the bin. It's yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the emotional wreck that that um, my friend is 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 going to cost me a lot of time. But if I have that attitude of this is my patch, mm. I'm here because this is my patch and this is my person, and I I have an opportunity to be here for this person. Well, that's and then this is this interesting word called um, of. Well, of apostolate, for example, being right. there and being able to say, look, your friends might be financially well off or they might be, you know, things might be going really well for them. That They might have a lovely house, a nice car, but they might be spiritual wrecks. Or miserable. Um, or miserable. And, 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 that's, and that's very real. And, and something that we started doing uh, before we left our place in Springwood was just trying to uh, do little things to not necessarily drop hints to the neighbours, but just to try and let them know that... Uh, there are things beyond them that we think are, are worth them checking out. <laughs> so, for example, at uh, Easter and Christmas, yep. um, we, when I say we, I mean my wife because she's talented at things like baking and things like that, and we'd make like little cakes and then get a little Easter card or Christmas card that was always mm. properly themed. They are really beautiful. And we just, you know, wish them, you know, the blessings of, of, of the period, let them know that we were praying for them uh, mm. and that we wish them all the best. And we just dropped yeah. that in their letterboxes up and down the street. I suspect, I mean... Our neighbours have noticed that we're Catholics and we didn't ever say anything to them mm. because every Sunday morning we get dressed up and get in a car and drive away and come back, you know, two or three hours later. So they they know something's going on and it's it's like clockwork in that particular like – the rest of our week's just mayhem, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that particular thing is like clockwork and we come home and we're always home on a Sunday. So it's a – it's yeah they they noticed that now the neighbor on the other side of the road had a great chat with me until he asked me what i did for a living and when i eventually admitted i said i was a university lecturer oh what do you like they really push until you say oh, i teach theology and he immediately switched off and said you can keep that rubbish and oh, and wow. the conversation has not ever gone behind beyond hello since because mm. there's a there's a fear of what he thinks is coming next and so in some respects I didn't have the chance to establish a relationship before he worked out that I was a Catholic. Whereas in other cases where I've been gaming with people or playing sport with people, we've had a relationship and then they've, they've gone, oh, you're Catholic. And it's become a conversation at that point because we're dealing with someone they know who is happens to be Catholic rather than the Catholic guy. Mm. And so. you have no idea the benefit that you're doing as well. Yeah. Like you might say one thing or the other, oh, that was a nice chat. But I mean, I've had people say just random things to me, you know, and like, and I've gone away and really internalized that and had a long, hard think. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, that makes an impact. I don't know if either of you, know, Beth or Box, have experiences like yeah. that. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm now a housewife. Uh, but <laughs> before I, I quit my job, I I think a little bit of a, um, a thing with full-time work, so nine to five, including commute, which was 40 minutes for me, um, and trying to get to the gym, keep myself healthy, it just wrecks you. And that's without children, you know. Right. It's, yep. I, f I found it really hard to kind of take on other people's problems at that time when I was quite tired. My husband was quite tired when yes. we got home. Mm, yep. um, and if you have like more free time, that's awesome. Like use it like yep. crazy if you can. But it was sort of funny, like just thinking about now, I thought, you know what? My patch was really my coworkers and we had a very mm. tight team. Yes. They worked out pretty quickly as Catholic. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, what'd you do on Sunday? Oh, I saw some friends, went to church, you know, had lunch, mm. uh, which was pretty good. Um, and I told them quite early I was pregnant as well. So I can't, kind of like have a bit of a pro-life sort of discussion. It's like, I really see this as a, like a little person, yep. which is beautiful, you know, and they were very accepting. I, I, you know, people think that I think at work, they think that everyone's going to be very, uh, will reject you and everything like that. But I think if they know you first, they know you're a cool person. You just yes. relax. Mm. But that's if you're not walking in with the crucifix held out. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. right. Captain Kabbalah. Oh, I that's see right. my problem. That's I right. see my problem. <laughs> 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 just hide the hide the <laughs> But yeah, it's, um, mm. but not hiding at the same time. Cause I yeah. think people just get really worried about it. It's like, just have a normal conversation with people. Mm. Tell them you went to the pub after church, you know? And I, yeah. I think mm. people, you know, there might be some people like, you know, your story, um, that guy kind of switching off. There's some people who've been, there's some hurt really deep there yes, that they yeah. might switch off immediately. Because there's an assumption of what you're going to say next oh, or what's yeah. going to happen next. And to be to be honest, part of that is that we're actually not, I think this is the block culture, like the yeah. the, the mm. blocking on Facebook becomes reality in real life. You just say, I don't need you anymore. We've mm. got too many people around us. Mm. We have to already choose where we invest our time. And if mm. someone gives us the slightest bit of, a bit of annoyance, we just mm. go, nope, that's it. Yeah. No more of that. I'll take all of the experiences which are good. What we end up with 
is a shallow set of friendships which are based mm. on whether I feel good in this particular company. Yeah. Right. And if I haven't been through, and the, the really strong friends I have, the ones which have lasted through thick and thin, have been precisely the ones that have either stuck by me when I'm not yeah. great, easy to get along with, or I've stuck by them, or in most cases, both. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, to take that further, I think um, even among Catholic groups that I know of, there's not just that blocking of the, the person. Um, there's been situations where people that don't even know me might start getting offensive about their comments about me. Oh, wow. Um, and it's one of those things where we, we don't seem to practice it in, in all the fields that we, we really need to practice it when right. it comes to other people in community. Um, we have that safety net of, well, I don't have to get to know this person. I right. just take offense with what they said. Mm. Therefore, I'm going to be offensive. Um, and it's interesting. It's in the country, you get that as in some sense because we were from the city. Even mm. though I was born and raised in the country, my parents were from the city. And so all the country people were, oh, the city folk. And because yeah. we didn't actually work on the land, we were, you know, you were the city folk. And 18 years I was in the country <laughs> and I was still the city kid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I never actually lived in the city or mm. for one year when I was a baby. But it just, I was the city kid because that was my niche. And I, you just had to own it. You just had to go, yeah. okay, <laughs> whatever. And also, you know, you're the, you're the religious kid or you're the whatever, mm. you know, so it was just different. If I didn't, you know, it, people saw past that and I made friends or didn't. But, mm. you know, you just had to, okay, whatever. But when they start saying you are this, therefore, yeah. you are annoying or I'm going to be mm. nasty to you, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, I guess that's the whole we need more annoying people thing. If mm. we are able to learn the skills to get past those initial annoying phases, if we can learn that, we actually open up an entire range of possibilities of relationships which are good and helpful, but most importantly, we learn how to love mm. because love, genuine love, looks past not just little superficial hurts. We actually we end up getting into real love, which means we respond with goodness for evil and Sorry. all those mm. sorts of things. And you'd say that that witness, just to tie it back to your proposition around the Benedict option, because we didn't go very deeply into no. it, and I know. <laughs> uh, another and, show, another yeah. show, <laughs> is essentially that, yeah, you don't, I guess you miss the opportunity to be able to learn to get along That's and right. help teach others to learn to get along with you, Catholics versus non-Catholics, uh, and yeah, and I'm really for that, actually, which is why yeah. we, while I say I moved to the, the country of the Blue Mountains, it's right on the edge of Sydney. Right? <laughs> and I still work in the city. I was going to say, you still commute to the city, so it's not quite the same. I used to have to drive half an hour at 100 kilometres an hour to get to my school um, mm. from where we lived in the country. So it's not quite the same commute. Um, and that was at a country town of about 20,000 people or something. So <laughs> it's, what, it's what city versus country people say. They say that the road to um, my wife's family is from Albury, for example, and they say that, you know, the, the, the trip from, Mor uh, from Sydney to Albury is uh, twice as long as the trip from Albury to Sydney. <laughs> 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 Simply because city people are just not used to commuting right. at, lo at long distances at mm. high speeds for that long. Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> and to be honest, part of me agrees. <laughs> 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 and and, and I, 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 I tip my hat, if I was wearing one, I would tip it, uh, to, 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 to country people who do, you know, have just that, that go do it attitude. The, yeah. You know, there's mm -hmm. someone in trouble. Yeah, they're 150 k's away. In That's the right. car, off we go. Right. S Sydney, it's the next suburb. Ah, oh, but traffic and you know, <laughs> yeah. I'll just send him a text and say, "You're right, mate." I have to say <laughs> though, right. that getting in the car and driving half an hour in the country is much less stressful mm. than going 15 minutes down the road in Sydney. Yep. And that's yeah. also true. And about 300% yeah. less idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Here's me talking about <laughs> patience with other people. No, mm. it's funny how we change. One, we'll have to do another show on our attitudes in certain modes, like driving or internet, um, mm. what changes us. It's now time for a segment we call One Minute Wonder. This is a segment where we share something we've seen, experienced this week, or has made us stop and wonder, something that's made us smile, or just appreciate life a little more. Box. I was talking recently to a friend of mine and, and, and saying how artists need limits. We, we tend to go crazy and not do anything when we don't have limits or guidelines. And it, it's very much with any other area of life and just life in general. And that may, really made me realise and, and I guess appreciate more the, the way in which we, we participate and practice our faith and, and, and what we do have um, to help us through and also to, to guide us. Mm. Yeah. Beth? Um, so I was in Byron Bay just this last week 
Uh, and my husband and I had decided to go for a walk along the beach, you know, as you do. Um, and it was a lovely walk, but it, <laughs> it was a bit windy, so we decided to turn back. And we'd been kind of walking up towards the lighthouse, and we could see the, um, the ocean was quite beautiful, flat and everything. We turned around, and I saw this amazing landscape of just these hills kind of like wo- like weaving between each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you'd have the really lightest blue, you know, as Box would know, <laughs> the lightest blue at the, the very... Uh, back of the mountains and then coming to like a like rather deep green blue and it just looked like a, it looked like a musical score wow and I just thought wow it's just this amazing rhythm you know God has really put in nature it just like really took my breath away I tried to take a photo it never does it justice so I'm like <laughs> okay that one stuck in my brain yeah <laughs> it's mm. beautiful hmm. yeah it's interesting uh, my one minute wonder is photos actually um I was looking through a bunch of old photos looking for a particular moment that I knew I'd taken a photo of. And I'm going, yeah, well, that was the event, but I don't know. And I realized exactly that thing. The the vivid image I had in my mm-hmm. head wasn't the photo and the photo couldn't capture it. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, you know what, there's some sort of value. A, a Jewish girl once posted uh, that I follow, once posted that she was annoyed at one stage because she wasn't allowed to use the camera on the Sabbath because her kids were always the cutest when they're all dressed up for the Mm. Sabbath. And she said, actually, it's given me a gift, which is that I just appreciate them rather than sit behind a camera. And I thought, maybe, actually, I should say, stop taking photos and actually just be there, Mm -hmm. be present. Anyway, that's enough. (laughs) That's it for this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking or arguing with your podcast device, let us know. You can subscribe to the podcast on thiscatholiclife.com.au. You can tell us what you liked or what you didn't like or what you'd like us to discuss in future. On that note, please keep those ideas coming. We do actually read them. We're trying to uh, take them on one at a time and find the right people to be talking about them. So keep those ideas coming. It's excellent to hear from you. You can continue the conversation with us by joining Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or our Discord chat. And you can find the links in the show notes or on our website. Be sure to write us a review on iTunes uh, to let everyone else know that we're here and share us around with your friends. Remember that this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast and we think that's an idea worth getting behind. So tell your friends. Before we go, it's time for shout outs. Ryan. The Praetorian Studio is the creative community I'm part of. Uh, shout out to you guys. Excellent. Beth. Um, I'd, I'd say the um, go and like, if you can, the um, Dominican laity of Australia. Ooh. So <laughs> keep an eye on it. Cormac. Who could just shout out to? Um, <laughs> no, I actually haven't. I, honestly, I haven't thought of one just yet. So it's a, yeah. Surprised your wife wasn't foremost on your mind. <laughs> 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 on Jeez. that note, I will shout out to my wife just to make Cormac feel worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for now. Thanks for listening to This Catholic Life.